So I'm passing the mic over to you, Okari, to kick us off. Fantastic. Thank you, Manny. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you this evening and, and, some, and several of our, our Gator family. And that's also Dr. Sarelis, really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with you regarding uh, your new role with the, with the Lamb Family School of Business. So hello, Gators. And again, welcome to tonight to, to the, uh, this evening's discussion. Uh, I am really pleased to be here with, to welcome our new dean and uh, with the Lamb Family College of Business, Dr. Eugene Savetas. We're gonna jump right in with questions, but I do wanna recommend that if you have a question as we're um, engaging in the conversation, really would welcome you to type into the chat function so that we can keep an eye on that, make sure we're getting your questions and having a, a live discussion. Uh, we really don't wanna be talking at you. We really want this to be an engaging discussion and we welcome your input into the conversation. So with that, we're going to jump right in. And um, actually, uh, Dean, if you would, please tell us what drew, drew you to San Francisco State University and what motivates you to take the position of Dean of the College. Of the college. Well, please first of all, thoughts. thank you. Thank you, Akari, for taking the time to do this. And uh, thank you to Manny and Janine for putting this together. And mostly thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I have always known of San Francisco State University from general name recognition, being in academia for the last 25 years. Um, but what drew me to the, the college, one is the location, right? For a business school, it's hard. One would have to really stretch to think of a better location than San Francisco, being such a hotbed for innovation in, in a variety of areas. The depth and breadth of offerings the college has to offer was another draw. I mean, we go well beyond the traditional business disciplines of accounting and finance and marketing into labor studies and hospitality, tourism, and such. And that breadth gives the possibility to scale and to uh, offer students a curriculum that they may not be able to get in a lot of different places. So at the undergraduate level, you'll see that the general business program is one of our largest majors because it is very versatile. And uh, I also felt that the Lamb family, the Larson, uh, the Chris Larson's and Lamb family contribution, the big gift they gave was a big draw. And I think the great alumni pool, the large alumni pool of the school was another factor. It's one of the most diverse uh, business schools in the country. So I believe that San Francisco State is ahead of the game of where other universities will be 20 years from today in the United States. Uh, the faculty were a big draw. I mean, they're trained in the leading doctoral programs. And most importantly, I believe that the Lamb Family College of Business has the opportunity, gives one the platform to rewrite the script of what it means to be a great business school. I mean, there's a traditional formula out there where you know, you offer doctoral programs and make the uh, entry into the college as selective as possible. And, and, and you know, and say, hey, we are a top business school. You know, um, uh, it's not what you do inside. It's just the, basically the inputs, you know. Uh, so here, I believe what we can do from the inside can actually rewrite the script of what it means to be a great business school. So those were really my, uh, what makes me excited about the college. Excellent. Excellent, and we we already got a question coming in, but we're gonna go through just a few more questions and then we're gonna get into some Q&A. So really appreciate it and wanna advise everyone that please keep the questions coming in. So, um, so, so Eugene, please tell us about your vision and the priorities for the Lamb College of Business, uh, Lamb Family College of Business, and what you hope to accomplish in your first year. Thank you, so fundamentally, I believe what we need to do is to create in our students a confidence that the education they are getting is second to none and to create a sense of excitement among the faculty and staff. Uh, so in terms of my priorities, uh, essentially I would like to make the Lamb Larson College of Business along with everybody, you know, because in, in this field, it's not never a one man show, you know, it's uh, uh, the faculty, the staff, the students uh, all play a part. Uh, is to make the Lamb Family College of Business the preeminent non-doctoral granting business school in the United States. And I think it's already halfway there because of the city, the size, the scale, the scope. But I think that's really what I want to do. So in 
conversations with uh, colleagues uh, and community members, we've identified seven priorities for the college. And we have formed five member task forces to work on these priorities. And we hope to have some concrete action plans by mid February. And one, and these priorities very quickly, uh, one is student obsession, trying to do the maximum possible for our students, trying to make it as easy as possible for them to experience the high quality education, um, innovate in the curriculum uh, to make sure it's cutting edge, uh, focus more on the community because this is a community uh, based institution. And I think so, I would like to see our college engage with the community in our teaching, in our research. Um, and uh, diversity and inclusion is a big uh, priority. Uh, trying to clarify the research identity of the college a little bit more. And basically, of course, fundraising, friend raising, and building the brand. So these are my priorities. Regarding what we hope to accomplish in the first year, it's essentially to have a good sense of what we can do and have a clear action plan on these seven priorities. Plus, of course, to see how we can deploy the uh, Lamb Larson gift to, to accomplish the, the intentions of the funders of the gift uh, okay. and to take the school, uh, uh, you know, in a to, uh, to, to scale greater heights with that gift. So that's really the priority. Excellent. I mean, and thank, thank you for that. Uh, as many started to the conversation uh, regarding everyone's working from home, you know, for the most part. And, and so the COVID-19 pandemic has really changed our world, the educational landscape in literally the last eight, nine months. So how are you and the faculty adapting to ensuring that San Francisco State students are staying on track to receive the educational skills that they'll need to be successful in this new job in economy? Job I think the faculty, economy. yes, very true. This is a very interesting time. And I believe to, there was all this talk that by 2040 or so, the universities will be heavily online. So I think we sort of kicked up the process 20 years ahead of time. So with respect to COVID, our faculty and the university and staff have done a heroic job. Uh, so the university through its uh, teaching and learning center um, launched training programs for the faculty uh, to uh, deploy uh, effective pedagogy online. So the faculty have put in a lot of work to ensure that they can you know, move from the face-to-face -face platform to the online platform. It does require a different approach because you don't see students face to face. So, so there's been a lot of effort, a lot of thought put into that. Um, and, you know, we are continuing with various programs by adopting it to the online world, by adapting it to the online world. So we, uh, student clubs, uh, we are still having uh, meet the firms in accounting, um, our career services is hosting a lot of open MIC forums. And the online platform does give a lot of opportunities as well, because for example, we can now bring in guest speakers from around the country and the whole world into our classrooms, right? Because everybody's so practiced on Zoom and uh, you know, uh, other such software that you know, we are able to actually make the world our classroom. So there are certain benefits, but we all hope that the pandemic uh, is over soon, like everybody else. So. Indeed. And, and Janine's actually put into the chat feature where you can learn more about what the campus is doing and how they're responding to COVID-19. So not now, but at some point, please definitely take a look and learn more about what the university is doing to really support the students. So now what I'd like to do is kind of turn to with the time frame that you've been in uh, and as a, serving as the, the dean, what have you learned that you didn't expect uh, since becoming dean of the Lamb Family College of Business? On a lighter note, I realized that San Francisco State loves acronyms. So I had to learn up a lot of acronyms. We don't like use just say teaching evaluations. We say SETI. And you know, so I was wondering what is SETI? And you know, so things like that. So the acronyms are big on acronyms. So that's one of the things I didn't expect. Um, and I honestly have been pleasantly surprised by, to latch on to your previous question, how um, um, I mean, how sort of seamless this Zoom uh, process was, you know, because I've been operating via Zoom for the past two and a half months, and all of us have, that it's still been very functional process. So that's a pleasant surprise, you know. 
great. All right. All right. Um, so, so as you start thinking about what you hope to bring that's new or different to Lamb College of Business, can you share some thoughts with the Gator family on what, what you're thinking that will be different and, and new that you bring based on your background and experience? So I, I'm a career uh, academic. I mean, I did work in the corporate world for a few uh, years, but I'm basically a career academic. Uh, and, uh, I, so, and secondly, I'm a marketer. So I always look at universities or in one way from a, on a perceptual map. And I do believe that I would like to inculcate a mindset that we can dream big. Uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, um, we are who we are but I think we can dream big. Uh, and that's what I would uh, really uh, hope to bring in. As far as what I bring that is new or different, uh, I mean, I guess every dean brings certain things into the, uh, uh, into the uh, equation. Uh, I was preceded by two deans who were both from the industry. So, uh, and obviously uh, had significant experience there. So I bring that a deeper academic perspective, having been an academic in both in the, um, um, you know, uh, uh, flagship research universities and in more balanced institutions. And I think that bring that perspective, which I believe, uh, uh, and having seen a lot of different universities in different, at different stages of um, their journey, uh, it uh, sort of, I get that sort of bring that perspective in and how we can, you know, use those, um, that insights to, you know, rewrite the script of what it means to be a great business school. So that's really, I, I guess I can answer that that way. Okay, very good. And so this next question is really about our, our alumni and our Gator family that we have here tonight and, and beyond. But I, I know that I, I've truly enjoyed serving on the Dean's Development Council and also establishing a foundation or I should say an endowment for uh, the, the College of Business. And, uh, and so that's something that I, based on the education experience that I've had with San Francisco State that I felt you know, the desire to really do something and give back. And so what I'm wondering is if you can share some thoughts with our alumni who are participating, uh, how they can get involved in, and make a difference in the next generation of Gators to follow. Uh, thank you, Akari, and thank you all for, for your involvement and your contributions to the, to the, to the college and to our students. Uh, so I would say first I'd take the recent, more recent alumni. Uh, they can play a very important role in terms of coaching our uh, students who are entering the job market, the, because the reason being that the kind of jobs they are in one year out or two years out is the jobs that our students will be interviewing for. So they can give them some inside guidance of what actually happens when you get into a job. You know, like it's one thing to say I'm an accountant or a marketer. What exactly do I do? So that's I think so I would love for our younger alumni to, uh, you know, help our current students, uh, coaching them on career options and so on. Um, I'd like all alumni to participate in our events. We organize a lot of events, business ethics weeks, women's emerging leadership forum, taste of the Bay and so on. So I would love for the alumni to participate in those events. Uh, love for them to hire our students where possible for internships and jobs. Uh, be good ambassadors for our college, right? Because you are, so if you see some uh, promising students, uh, I recommend our college to them, uh, you know, for graduate programs, undergrad programs. Alumni should consider us as a location for lifelong learning. And of course, uh, uh, if you can, if you are so fortunate and you can pay it forward, that'd be wonderful, you know, uh, um, you know, in terms of uh, helping us fundraise and friend raise, uh, that would be uh, much appreciated. Um, and of course, please stay engaged in the, with the college, you know, if you are in the business world, you know, many of our classes could utilize guest speakers. So, so there are a lot of different ways to uh, stay in touch. Uh, so it all depends on the alumni, their own interests and their own, uh, I guess, station in life and life stage and things like that. So, oh, that, That's wonderful, Eugene. And I, I'll tell you that I, the, when I taught my class, the Leadership in Action class uh, at, at San Francisco State in the MBA program, you know, it really came through actually t participating in another instructor's course as a guest speaker. So to your point, it's a wonderful way to give back to the student population, share your experiences. Uh, in, in that way, it's really interesting that you know so much 
because of you know, the fact that you've gone through your career and there's not a whole lot that you have to prepare for because you're talking about your life experiences. So it's a great opportunity to really make a, a difference in the um, in the lives of the next generation coming behind. So we really appreciate you sharing those thoughts. And, and Gators, we clearly have our marching orders now of things that we can do to be involved, and I hope that you will take the opportunity to do so. As we move from this component of our discussion, because we definitely have uh, want to move to Q&A, and we really want to hear from many of you who are on the call on this, this Zoom with us, um, I wanted to uh, ask you, Eugene, if you have any thoughts about um, or perspectives of what you want to share with the Gator community before we go to Q&A, just other things that you know, are top of mind for you that would be valuable for this group to hear about. Yeah, we would love for our alumni to engage with us in a variety of ways. Uh, that is very important to us and to me. So please feel free to reach out. And LF Cobb, the Lamb Family College of Business, is a great school that is poised for greater things. I mean, we are all in uh, tough times because of the COVID pandemic and the impact it has on, on the state's budget and, and uh, such. But uh, st still, it's, it's, uh, so please uh, be in touch and please get engaged. And thank you for coming today as well. So. Excellent, excellent. All right, so I'm going to, I want, so first of all, let me thank you, Eugene, for first of all, thinking of this idea of coming forward as you're you know, really getting started to really share your thoughts and views with you know, our Gator community uh, so that we could hear from you and, and your uh, perspectives of what we can look for uh, from the Lamb Family College of Business in the future. We're going to now move to some questions, and I believe that Janine's going to open up the Q&A. And um, Janine, would you like to start uh, with the questions? Yes, thank you so much, Akari, and thank you, um, Dr. Savetas, for um, kicking our Q&A and our meet and greet off. Um, let's start with Jeff's question. Jeff, thank you so much for asking. He would love to hear more about the School of Business's current diversity and inclusiveness initiatives and how things might change if Prop 16 were to pass um, in just a couple of days, November 3rd. Sure. Um, so one of the strategic priorities I've identified is to take a look at uh, diversity and inclusion efforts within the college. And we appointed, a, 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 we have a five member task force, uh, two appointed and three elected, and that includes students, uh, um, faculty and staff. Uh, and so we were taking a look at our processes and during the fall kickoff uh, that we hold an all college meeting in the fall, we actually spent about half the time looking at diversity and inclusion and looking, dividing uh, call, uh, the participants into small groups to discuss and identify ideas that we might actually implement. Um, now, it's uh, San Francisco State was very recently identified by the Wall Street Journal as one of the most diverse um, uh, colleges in the universities in the United States. And as you know, right from the 1960s, uh, San Francisco State has uh, been at the forefront of looking at diversity and inclusion issues. And as a city too, you know, what San Francisco thinks today, the country and the world thinks 25 years later. So we are always ahead of the curve in terms of, of diversity. Um, so, uh, so I think we are, uh, it is a big priority for us. So I'm waiting for what the task force says, but in the, in the meantime, also, we are uh, looking at things like, you know, how to uh, uh, help uh, students who are underrepresented students, you know, how to uh, give them more career guidance. So one of our biggest um, uh, emphasis in the past couple of years has been the career center that we have. And I believe the career center has also has got a big role to play here, you know, in trying to prepare students uh, from a diverse background for the corporate world, going beyond the classroom and such. So with Prop 16, uh, I, uh, so for our college, I mean, since we are, we are already one of the most diverse colleges and, uh, uh, so I think the, the Prop 16 uh, as a whole, uh, you know, we normally, I guess, the advisors in public universities don't, don't comment on specific electoral issues. So I won't uh, uh, get into that per se, but uh, uh, I think our college is, is well prepared. We are at the forefront in terms of diversity. And as we all know, diversity is, um, uh, is an ongoing um, effort. It's not that somebody turns on a light switch and you know, everything uh, gets fixed. So, but I think we are, 
uh, uh, we have a lot to look forward to because of our brand heritage in this uh, in this field. Thank you, Eugene. Um, our next question comes from Daniel Del Greco. Daniel, would you like to unmute yourself and ask yourself or? Hello, Professor. Uh, yeah, you know, I did the program from 2010 to 2012. And back then the program was on two floors. There was guest speakers every every Monday night. There was Thirsty Thursday events. There was a lot more uh, hotel cubicles to meet with the professors. There was a lot more study groups then. We could have study groups before class, study groups on Saturday morning. So it seems like the program is, has shrunk a little bit. Um, and I'm wondering what you're gonna do to grow the program. I think it is one of uh, our top priorities to grow the program. Um, so we have, uh, for grow all the grad programs in general, we have the masters in accounting. Uh, we also started a program in South San Francisco uh, biotech MBA program as well. So we are committed to downtown. Uh, part of the challenge we are facing is that uh, MBA programs per se are at the so-called at the mature to decline stage of the product life cycle. So there's a national decline in, in terms of MBA enrollments. And secondly, uh, a second challenge we face is that because San Francisco is such an attractive city, a lot of programs from outside other parts of the country have come into San Francisco, like INSEAD and Wharton and you know, Babson and such. So there's much more intense competition that we face. And third is the growth of online programs. Uh, so, you know, back, you know, maybe 20 years ago, a lot of the online programs may lack credibility, but today, very many elite MBA programs are now offering uh, mostly online format programs where you can come into campus once a month for a weekend and, you know, take the rest of it online and such and things like that. So the competitive landscape has changed quite a bit. But having said that, none of these factors can be excuses. We have to double down. So we are taking a look at our pro program offerings. What can we uh, do to make them more relevant? Is there a different kind of format, delivery format that we should look at? Uh, you know, in terms of, uh, so yes, so we, uh, but uh, we have to put in the marketing resources behind it. And yes, we would want to grow the program. The program has shrunk a lot. And, and actually, if you have some ideas or thoughts, uh, please do email me too, especially if you think you, because you've gone through the program, you see what might be some of the things that we could highlight or fix. Um, that would be very helpful as well. Thank you, Eugene. Um, I see that Erin has made comment here about uh, the classroom work that she had. Erin, um, did you want to uh, ask a question as well? Here we are. Sorry, I'm outside. Uh, yeah, I wanted to just get your sense of how to better connect the theoretical classroom setting to the actual skills, because uh, I graduated in 2019 in December. And so this year while interviewing, it's just been a lot of focus on the different like software and uh, really relying heavily on the, the coursework that I did and like those projects and like really just trying to improve the quality um, of all of those things for each you know, student going forward. Um, so uh, I guess the uh, business colleges of business today are focusing a lot on experiential learning. And I think uh, that is a big component of, you know, uh, and then of course, encouraging students to do more internships. So I don't know how many internships you did because then one of the challenges we would have uh, is that, you know, uh, because a lot of our students are commuter students and they are also working full time. So a lot of times those internships are tough to do. Maybe in certain places like accounting, it's a lot easier than in some other fields. So I think we need to encourage students to do more internships. The student clubs can play a big role in those because the, the academic type student, the marketing club, accounting club, and so on, where they can also get projects to do more hands-on uh, so those are the best ways, you know, then, um, um, so basically I think that's really the key here um, to uh, prepare students and get students more exposure from the classroom because a lot of times you get prepared by 
ex, ex, uh, seeing other people who are more advanced in their careers, listening to them, interacting with them. Then you pick up small bits and pieces here, what to do, what not to do, and so on. So. Thank you, Eugene. And to add to that, any alumni who have internship opportunities or mentorship interests or work, work study projects or ideas on how to get Gators out in the field, you can always reach out to our career services and, and um, professional development department, as well as M Manny and myself, and we'll be able to connect you. We'll share our contact information both in the chat as well as at the end of this presentation. Um, our next question comes from Brenda. Brenda, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask? Hi, uh, thank you for taking my questions. Um, and thank you for uh, spending this evening with us to get to know us. So I graduated in 2017 and uh, I wholeheartedly agree with what you just said about internships and how, how key they are to getting a really good job coming out of college. And that was uh, what I attribute um, you know, my success coming out of college too. And I hope that um, you can instill that into professors uh, in their curriculum and uh, to have them emphasize how important it is uh, to have that experience in college. But my question uh, was actually having to do with um, what you believe are going to be the most challenging areas um, that you'll face as Dean in implementing your vision, be it, um, you know, maybe student graduation rates, uh, dealing with university politics, um, you know, getting, getting all the professors on the same page. What do you think are gonna be the challenge areas for you? Um, so I, I would say that the um, biggest challenge area is that uh, we uh, could use more financial resources because, if, because uh, uh, if we had more financial resources, you know, like simple thing like career center, you know, like instead of one uh, career guide, we could have eight or 10, you know? So I think so a lot, lot of this comes from uh, that. Uh, so, but uh, I think we have to, as a academic, I do recognize that, uh, you know, having conversations with different stakeholders, uh, having patience is very important. Academia is very slow to change, but, change does happen. Uh, because I think we mostly all of us agree on the same things. I mean, we want our students to succeed. Uh, I, I don't think there's, I've never met any faculty member anywhere else who thinks otherwise. So I think it's just that we may have slightly different philosophies here and there, but by and large, we, uh, we are all united in the same goal. And I think the, the key here is to um, uh, be as transparent, be as open, uh, be as inclusive as possible. And through that, uh, we can, uh, but I think fundamentally we have to, uh, to motivate all our colleagues and, you know, to get them to work together uh, to, uh, to accomplish what we can. So the, the challenges that we now face uh, um, at the university level, I mean, uh, like, uh, Daniel alluded to one challenge, which is the declining enrollment in the MBA program, right? Because we can throw a nice party. If nobody shows up, you know, the, the, you know, it's not going to be a nice, fun party. So the thing is that we have to uh, focus heavily on enrollments. Uh, we have to, of course, uh, uh, as Erin said, we have to uh, make sure that our curriculum is cutting edge. And, and we want to make uh, at, at least the Lamb Family College of Business a sort of a destination program. So, so I, I, you know, uh, going back to, uh, you know, you did your uh, undergrad here, right? Uh, so what made you choose us as opposed to, um, let's say, uh, what other colleges you were looking at? And what can we use to draw people to uh, our college? So, uh it's funny because I, I chose it for the same reason you did the city, <laughs> <Okay>. the location. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So we have to highlight that more. We have to deepen our ties with the community more. Uh, I do want to, um, uh, we have a Dean's development council. I'm very focused on expanding that, trying to get into certain verticals like, uh, you know, um, uh, venture capital and, you know, uh, tech, and such because they are in our background, in, the, in our area. So I think uh, that's what's important. 
Thank you, Brenda, and thank you, Eugene. Um, we, our next question comes from Jeff, who has a question about teachings of the future. Jeff, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Dr. Zvedis. Um, thank you. I saw a disturbing commercial last night. <laughs> Not so disturbing, but it talked. Uh, they were offering a uh, program for kids to learn code. So the kids that are coming into college, maybe not now, but in five years or 10 years, especially the ones that haven't been in classrooms for a bit, how, how are you gonna teach those kids? They're, they're gonna come in probably way far advanced than, than the children that are gonna be coming in the next couple of years. Um, I, I think uh, this, um, um, I think what we have to teach them is to be lifelong learners. And, we, and, and the idea is that we have to be more flexible in terms of uh, if the students have already at a certain level in terms of their education, a lot of colleges are allowing more credits to be transferred in uh, to, to shorten the, the, the degree, uh, the length of the degree up to a certain point. And uh, uh, the, uh, so yes, I mean, I think uh, what's, I mean, I have also read through a lot of uh, conversations uh, about, uh, you know, what happens, how will learning look like in 10 years or 20 years, you know, because today with YouTube and, and, and Google and, and such, uh, a lot of knowledge is no longer what it used to be, because uh, you can look it up much more easily than, than you could 25 years ago, or, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, so uh, I think our uh, mindset on, uh, on how we train our students, what the future of education will look like. I mean, some of the fundamentals remain the same, the ability to write well, the ability to talk well, the ability to think critically, uh, to, be, to have some facility with numbers. Um, those things are going to remain, but I, uh, I think so. It, it's going to be a gradual process. Uh, and, and yes, and also talking about kids knowing to code today that I, I was just reading something yesterday, which said that there are now some software that can actually do the programming if you just tell it what it needs to do. So, so it is, it's interesting to, uh, I mean, we all will be there for the journey in whatever way, but I think as a, as a, from an educational perspective, it forces us, especially in fast changing fields to, you know, to, to stay current ourselves uh, as, as faculty, you know, because many times what we learned 20 years ago may become uh, somewhat dated. So, uh, so especially in fields that are fast changing in certain fields. Yeah, it's the fundamentals don't change as fast, you know, like, um, so that's the difference between teaching history, let's say, and teaching, uh, you know, like programming, because things that you learned and new things are coming up, but it, it's going to be a fun journey and exciting journey. That's the, uh, but we have to be more adaptable and flexible instead of being rigid. That's my view. Wonderful, thank you so much. Our next comment comes from Marge Josephson. Um, Marge, do you want to say your comment aloud? Okay, um, she says, build your network now as you're studying as a, as a, as a tip to um, networking and really finding those opportunities. Um, and adding, you know, the 16 folks on this, on this uh, wonderful event as um, ways to find jobs are getting harder and harder and headhunters are not as valuable as they used to be. I would also like to encourage everyone here to join the Lamb Family College of Business LinkedIn group. I'll, send, I'll, I'll add that to the chat as well. And do we also have any other questions? Eugene, I'll ask another one. You know, so I'm very interested in understanding. You know, the fact that COVID-19 has really changed fundamentally how colleges and universities are engaging with students, and the, the, just the idea of when we think about, uh, at least in, in boards that I sit on, you know, I'm hearing about how the college experience is becoming, you know, very different, and that some universities and colleges are actually being uh, significantly hit. You know, in terms of their, um, you know, the, the, either their fundraising or just dollars coming in, because a lot of students are taking a gap year because they're like, I, I don't want to pay for University of Phoenix. You know, so I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how do we uh, kind of combat that to 
to make sure the students do have a, a really good experience or that uh, how, do, how do we, you know, avoid, you know, being uh, someone who's kind of be, that, that you, you, we're not a, a, a university of choice for students in a situation like this pandemic or, or beyond? I think it is tough as far as the colleges and universities facing trouble um, to, to some degree, uh, especially in the East Coast, in New England and stuff, some of the smaller colleges have gone under. Uh, or, uh, and so basically all that has happened is that the pandemic has sort of accelerated a process which might have happened uh, anyways, 10 years or five years down the road for some of those colleges. Um, so for us, I guess the, the, uh, the, the, the fundamental thing we have to do is to get students engaged. And so I think, uh, um, and it's not just in the classes that we, uh, the student clubs, uh, events such as these, or you know, events with employers, events with um, uh, community members, or you know, that giving students a sense of community is very important so that they don't feel isolated uh, from uh, from each other and and stuff. And as far as whether online learning alone can it replicate the classroom learning, uh, it especially for if you're talking of very uh, traditional age students, you know, like the high post high school coming right into college, uh, a lot of the learning happens outside the classroom, right? And that's true of the workforce too. I mean, a lot of the learning happens in the hallways and in the, uh, uh, and other places, um, lunchroom and so on. So yes, so they, it'll, that experience will be somewhat um, uh, altered from this. And at our end, what we are trying to do is we are making sure that the, uh, we are not replicating the, um, the face-to-face uh, -face and just slapping it into an online version. So our approach to teaching has to change. So for example, to give a specific example, uh, you know, in certain fields, uh, more quantitative fields, there is a tendency to do a lot of high stake exams, right? You give, to, uh, so uh, I think replicating that in the online uh, world may not work for everybody. Uh, where you come into a class and take a two hour exam. So what might we have to think differently, give more projects, give different kinds of assignments so that the learning is still taking place. Uh, that is your, uh, the classroom discussion can be replaced somewhat with the on message board discussions, have some uh, live sessions like these. Uh, so, uh, so, so yes, yeah, so we have to all try different methods. Uh, and to students, I would say, just hang in there. I mean, in this pandemic, I mean, uh, will go away. And in the interim, I think, uh, uh, I, I still think we are um, still offering a, a good quality education with rigor, even if it's online. I mean, some of the social components may be missing, but mm -hmm. uh, students should focus on trying to get that by staying in touch with their classmates and professors and such. Got it. Engage. If you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to use the chat function. Uh, I'll ask one, one other one while we uh, see if there are any additional questions, Eugene. And, and this is kind of going off of something that you said, as well as Brenda. Uh, both of you mentioned that you joined or that you came to San Francisco. You came to the you know San Francisco today because of the city, right? And so it, I think it's important. At, at least I'm a big fan of giving back to which you've gotten. And so in, in this case, what, what can the, what, what's the value that the Lamb College family, or excuse me, the Lamb Family College of Business uh, can bring to San Francisco or the local community? What, what, how do we want to give back? Um, so, well, first of all, fundamentally, uh, as the college goes, as far as the college goes, we are one of the primary providers of workforce to businesses in this city. Right, we train a lot of the workforce in this city, and we are an anchor institution and a community institution. So that's that makes us different from Stanford. If Stanford tomorrow was in New Jersey, probably the student body would still look the same as it does in Palo. But our student body is drawn from our uh, community. So what I do want all the community leaders to be aware of is that we are like in retailing. You have anchor anchor stores, right? The big department stores. So we are an anchor institution in this city and in this community. We are also a center for lifelong learning. Uh, Jeff had a question earlier about, uh, you know, uh, students learning how to code already when, by the time they come into college. So today, I think what we are finding is that because of the fast changing world, 
uh, it's not simply that you finished your high school or your college and you're all set. I think learning is something that happens lifetime, right? Like if you are doing socks, right? Socks didn't exist, what, maybe 15 years ago or- Exactly. 20, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> we, have to, we have to also offer those platforms for you know, more continuous, continuing education. And fundamentally, as SF State is an engine of social mobility for a large number of people. And I think that's our mission. Uh, that's who we are, and that, and we want the city to be aware of that. You know that in the sense that we have uh, uh, transformed lives, and hopefully, this others in the city will partner with us on that uh, the, that aspect of our mission. Yeah, fantastic. Gators, hey, hey, any additional questions we want to ask of Eugene before uh, handing it over to um, to Manny? if there's anything else. Ah, okay, I see, see one. Brenda, do you want to go ahead and, and ask your question? Uh, sure. I, it was just something that was talked about a little bit earlier. Are you taking any different approach to uh, student organizations and engaging with them at the, at the college level at all? Yes. So actually, I'm meeting with them. Uh, I, I believe it's, it's tomorrow or again. Uh, and uh, I, I I'm a, I've advised student organizations at different stages of my career and student organizations have to be run by students. There are certain organizations that do well uh, because, of, but I think the whole idea is we want to do an audit of what percentage of students are involved in organizations because the same 10 people show up for everything, you know? Uh, so <laughs> we, want to, uh, uh, we want to figure out ways that the student organizations can be more useful. Right, so a lot of times students don't show up because they don't think it's worth their time, right? So the product, it's not simply posting flyers everywhere. It's about whether the product has anything in it to draw students. And I think, and the ways that during orientation, during advising, uh, during sessions with career services, they have to uh, keep drilling um, um, the importance of the student organizations to the students. Uh, and to actually hear testimonials as to how the student or participating in the student organization help the students. Because, you know, it helps build leadership skills. Uh, any, anybody can pay 20 bucks membership fee and put a membership in their resume. You know, I mean, that's not what we are talking about. We, what we are saying is that, um, like, what, what, how can this student organization be useful to you? Uh, and, you know, like, whether it's building your leadership skills, uh, whether it's building your network, I believe, I think um, uh, Marge had a comment earlier about the importance of building networks. Uh, uh, you know, so basically, uh, one of the great things about a student organization is if you get into that leadership, you can actually change the direction of that organization. It's not, you don't have to be kind of stuck in what the organization has been doing. So you are like the CEO of that organization. You can change it and take it in a different direction. So uh, the whole idea is we have to monitor participation and see why students aren't participating. But uh, so that's, so yes, it is, it is very, very important to, um, uh, to get students to participate more. Thank you. We, I had a brief comment. That. I just want to tell you back back when I went to school, I got my my BSBA in 2005, and I knew then they told us then that if I came to do my MBA within seven years, I would uh, have a year off of the MBA. Right, the first half of the program would be waived. So in 2010, I was thinking about that. I was thinking to myself, hey, if I want to do the MBA now, is the time to do it, or in the next year or so. In addition, my company was reimbursing up to 10,000 a year for education. So if I started in the fall, the fall would be paid. Then the following year, I'd have to pay, you know, about half. Um, and then the, the, the springtime, again, my company would pay. So it became a timing thing where the, the seed was planted when I was doing my, my BA, my, my BS. And then the, uh, it continued when I found out that a good portion of the MBA would be uh, covered. When I was doing it, Dr. Gupta did things like he took us down to Cisco to look at the telepresence, which was cutting edge, you know, before Zoom. And we went and we did a tour of the Dreamforce. Uh, we got everybody got, um, you know, in, in our marketing class got passes and we walked through the, the cloud computing, which is so much of this city now, which was cutting edge 10 years ago. So there was all these things that kind of tied together with what the city was doing that, you know, uh, made it worthwhile to, to network with people before class and to go out for drinks after class. 
So it, it's, I think some of that, you, you lose a lot of that with, with the online and with the way things are going. But I, I don't know if it, as the city's changed to cloud computing and tech, if, if, this, if the college has kept up with the trends and stuff. So something to think about. Very true. I agree. Thank you. Um, thank you, Daniel. Um, we have one, uh, one question from Don Endo. Don, go ahead and um, unmute yourself. Good evening, Dr. Cervantes. Thank you for um, putting on this presentation. It's very helpful, I think, for everybody on the call. Manny, how are you doing, Manny? <laughs> Good to yeah, see Don, you. Yeah, Don, thank you. Good to see you as well. Great. Uh, Dr. Cervantes, you know, you're, you're coming from, I guess, the Washington area um, where you were previously at. And so, you know, one of the things we, we face being at San Francisco State in a city of San Francisco is that um, our students oftentimes compete with a number of well-known name universities from UCs to Stanford's to uh, USF's, um, Santa Clara's, um, you know, you name it. There's a whole host of well-known universities in the area. Uh, what are your thoughts about yourself, get, yourself getting more involved in the business community in San Francisco to sort of expound on the representations of San Francisco State that, you know, the students that come out of our university are actually, you know, not only diverse, but um, well-educated and uh, oftentimes come with a much better work ethic in some many cases than, you know, the other graduates that are coming out of some of these competing universities. Have you had any thoughts about becoming more involved in the, in, in the business community in San Francisco? Um, whether it's working with, uh, you know, uh, uh, President Mahoney or, you know, anything like that. What are your thoughts about that? Because um, I'd be curious to hear that. Uh, my thoughts are that it's extremely important and it's one of the things I, I, I really want to do. And that's one of the th reasons I was thinking of expanding our development council from 10 to 35 plus members so that uh, we get more outreach. And of course, uh, other ways to outreach is through like the chambers of commerce and, and to meet with uh, leaders uh, from different organizations. So it is a top priority and for a business school, it has to be a top priority uh, because I think fundamentally, um, yes, uh, for our students, we do offer a good product uh, we do train students well, but yes, it is a very competitive marketplace. And, and, and I think we do want to make sure that our students land good jobs at the end of the process. And not only the, and that's why uh, the, a lot of the ancillary things that we do are important. So connections with the business community are paramount and, and we have to look at uh, how to do it. So one thing we are fortunate is we do have a large alumni base and a lot of that is based here, but I don't think we have like tapped into it adequately. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, that is going to be a big, a big priority for us and uh, collectively. Um, and I think, and I agree with you that the importance of it is, is significant. Uh, and any guidance that you can give us on how we can accomplish that would also be uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we could have time for one last question, and uh, that would be from Brenda. So, Brenda, you get the last word. Uh, the pressure's on. Um, actually, my question kind of stems from what Don was saying about how um, the students are competing against other uh, students from more prestigious colleges. And I found out to be very true. And uh, now that I'm on the other side of the table, looking at resumes uh, for potential uh, applicants in finance, especially, I would say um, that oh, over the last few years, it seems like the College of Business was solving for higher graduation rates. And it feels like some of the curriculum maybe was, I, I wouldn't say, um, you know, made less difficult, but there was some movement that happened that I think maybe unintentionally resulted in students coming out with a um, a skill set that didn't quite match up with some of the uh, jobs that they're trying to get into. Right? Uh, I was wondering if if you know you had any experience with this, uh, or if that's something that maybe that you had looked into that you could speak to a little bit. Um. 
So uh, where do you work? I work in equity research at Dodge and Cox, uh, which okay. is a very large firm in, in San Francisco. It's actually a San Francisco based firm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I think what, what is very important here is that uh, the curriculum should not be diluted, right? Because the, the, the uh, product that we produce uh, has to compete uh, uh, well. And I don't uh, uh, <clears throat> believe that is the case, but the, um, the, the question, the, the, uh, what we can do in that is one important thing is that each department or each area uh, should strengthen their own advisory boards. Uh, and one of the things that, so among the strategic priorities that I have put, uh, one is, uh, you know, student obsession, which is wh how, what is the maximum we can do for our students. And I do believe in, there was a previous comment on the chat about, you know, the, having the technical software skills and so on and so forth as well. Um, and I also made a comment earlier to Akari that, uh, you know, the younger alumni can help us because they kind of know what these students will be interviewing for. So to make sure that our curriculum has those skills uh, necessary for students to succeed. Um, and I think so continuous engagement and conversation with the employers uh, as well as to what kind of skills are they looking for in students and melding that back into the curriculum is, uh, is very critical. And to answer your question, yes, I do have experience with that because when we design or redesign or refresh a curriculum uh, for a field like ours, we have to also take the employer's perspective into mind, making sure that the skills that the employers need are being reflected in the curriculum. Uh, and uh, so in your particular case, or from your experience, what are the skills that are lacking? Uh, is it technical skills? Is it... Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, what I find a lot of finance students and uh, just general business accounting students coming out with is uh, a lot of theory based, um, you know, skills, but not a lot of, uh, you know, th they don't translate well into actually sitting down and doing a project or doing a case study or answering, you know, a, a technical question in an interview, for example, that sort of thing. So, um yeah, I, I think that those those areas definitely need to be beefed up a little bit. And uh, the way that, you know, sort of my generation supplemented that is through uh, student organizations uh, who were putting on, you know, seminars and workshops, teaching students these skills, you know, financial modeling, um, you know, sort of three statement accounting analysis, that those those sort of things. Um, interview prep, you know, which could be supplemented through the career center, that sort of thing. So um, there are a few financial or there are, there are a few student organizations out there that are really putting an emphasis on this that do a really, really good job on that. And uh, I hope that one day that could actually just be incorporated into the curriculum so that, like you said, um, you know, all students can participate in not just the 10 that show up to student organizations. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Uh I'll t I'm taking notes about what you said as well. So, Thank you, Brenda. Um, I think we have one last final question. So Marge, did you want to ask your final question before we wrap up? Yeah, it's more of a comment. Okay. Uh, actually, two comments. And I apologize for not showing my face, but I've been working at home, you know. Um, <laughs> two things. One is you were talking about, you're talking about getting practical experience and um, pushing people together to uh, the greater good so that when you go into the workforce, you're prepared. So I, I didn't hear anything about teams, people working on projects in teams. And I think that I know that that's where I would get the most practical experience because you have, you have to work together, which is a huge thing to learn um, and produce something. But the second thing I wanted to mention too, you were, um, you were talking about um, organizations and bringing them in and working together uh, with, the, with the population. And my example that I could give is, um, you know, I'm, I work in venture capital, healthcare-based. Uh, 
you know, the founder of my company is one of the fathers of biotech. So I've really been into the Healthcare Business Women's Association. And about five years ago, seven years ago, something, something like that, your uh, business and development gentleman, and his name escapes me right now. He and I had a couple of very long conversations. And after a couple of years, we finally got San Francisco State on board as, as a corporate partner. Okay. Yet, I haven't, when I, up until sheltering in place, and along with that membership, there's so much that, it, and it doesn't have to be just women, we take men too. <laughs> But I didn't, I didn't see any of those free memberships being used and people coming to the organization and the things that they could learn and just, just this one, but there's a million different organizations that could do the same thing um, to take advantage of that and take it as an extra learning thing and expand your network. I'm all about network. <laughs> um, you know, and speaking skills and how to have that that offhanded chat with people you've never met before and how can I get into your network because with everyone has their own network so I think that the push I'd love to see I'd love to know if HBA is still a part of um, working with San Francisco State because it was a big piece a few years ago um, but I think there's several organizations that would benefit um, bringing the people in I, you know, I also have one other thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't, I graduated, I didn't really graduate from San Francisco State. I got night, I went to uh, the night school for the um, uh, human resources certification, which took me to a vice presidency. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but I went to a SUNY school and somehow they've they've found me and i'm sorry this is all about me but it's the only examples i can use oh, no. and they just asked me to come in and talk to them talk to their nursing students about how to get a network how to find a job how to perform how to be you know all of the things that aren't taught are, aren't talked about at um, a college level and brenda i think you 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 were looking at that as well so I'm available to talk about this. I, you know, one-on-one -on -one or something. I, it's right up my alley, and I, I really enjoy doing it, working with the students, especially. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's uh, Manny. You have a comment on that, or? Oh no, no, no. I was going to say thank you. Appreciate that comment, and um, mm -hmm. we can look to follow up with you on that. Yeah, we will. Thank you. Well, um, you know, this has been a great event. I want to thank our guest speakers, uh, Dean Civitas and uh, Mr. Okari Ramsey for making the time tonight um, at their busy schedule for joining us uh, for this meet and greet of our new incoming Dean. So thank you both. And a really big shout out. Thank you to all of you for attending um, this evening's event, um, for taking it out of your own busy schedules as well to join us and to learn a little bit more about the Land Family College of Business and, and also the you know, the vision and the future for, for the business school with our incoming new dean. So thank you for joining us.